Disaster man. What's going on? In Adelaide? Yeah. Love in Adelaide. So now look, uh, as someone who is one of the founding members of Downside, I guess tell us basically how you guys form Downside. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. So with it's Scotty, uh, and he used to be Dynamites, but he just called himself Shabazz now. So Optimus and Shabazz went to Craigie High and they kind of grew up together in the high school and did they did the hip hop thing, run around, you know, graffiti rats, all that, you know, that hip hop shit. <laughs> and um I actually I was kind of like really into kind of just I was like, man, I want to make beats, I want to make beats. So trying to make beats and I was like coming out of high school and stuff. And then I was like, oh, you know, what's the next step to kind of making beats and stuff, you know, maybe do the recording engineering thing because I was kind of really interested in that. So I went to TAFE and then I met Optimus because he went to TAFE as well. And then like we were like, hey, man, and he goes, oh, yeah, man, I'm just doing my thing, got this tape. And that Scotty and Shabazz were actually kind of downside and they did a cassette called Behind the Bucket. So there's a really rare first downside release that's on cassette. Um, and he showed me that. And I actually never heard Australian hip hop before. So what that, year was that? I think that was 96. No, 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 not 96. Sorry, wrong. Um, 90, 98, 98. So this is Downside before you were a part yeah. of Downside. So they, they did that 97. Pretty sure it was 97. And then 98, I joined well, I met Scotty and he, uh, like, I just put it, he goes, listen to this, this is what we do. And I was just like, sick, this is, this is the shit. This is, this is what I want to do. And I was kind of rhyming back then, but not really like the full like Australian style. And then, um, yeah, they were like, oh, and then the whole thing was like the getting back to this freestyle thing. Like that's how I kind of developed my own voice mm. was freestyling with them. Because we all used to just freestyle in the car doing the four bar blues thing. Yeah, yeah man, that's that back in the day shit. Yeah, for, for real, for real. So yeah, that's and then after that, that like went and hung out in this place called Yuri Yarkin, which is an Aboriginal theatre. But the dude there, the um, director at the time, is like, "Yeah, we've got all this music gear. I think they had an Emu sampler keyboard there. I can't remember exactly what they had there. And there was an ADAP machine that we recorded on and stuff like, like the no no computers at the time. So yeah, that was." That's how it formed, and that's how we did. The first release that you guys did as Downside, because you mentioned that that release before in 97, that wasn't actually titled as Downside. Um, I think it was because, yeah, Scotty and Shabazz were still, they, they were the actual original core guys. Then I came along, and then, then we decided to go bang, you know, like, let's just keep, yeah. And then, so when you joined the group, what was the first release that Eponymous. you guys? So Eponymous. tell us a bit about that. Like, what year was that? I think that was 2000, if I remember correctly. So that was before Culture Kings 1? Yes. Um, so we did that, and then um, that was basically an indie thing. I can't remember who destroyed it so far, far back now, but um, yeah. Yeah, that was basically, like, I got together with it. Um, so after that, like, met with Scotty and he's like, yeah, I showed him some beats that I made. He's like, oh, sick, sick, come, let's let's do this thing at Yuri Yark. And so then we just basically made a bunch of tunes and that was Epinonymous. And then at the time of that particular album, we were all going to, um, in during making that, we'd go to High Park on a Monday, which is a, like a very... It was a foundation for Perth hip hop, the Perth hip hop scene. Um, big shout outs to Nate Dog for running that and starting that, and that actually started off as punk metal night, and then these DJs, the dude started DJing and he was also into to hip hop and started to spinning, and then we came down and it was like, I don't know, like it was just all this. It was like an under. It was more of an underground night. So all the underground genres are just 
rock up on a Monday night. But there was like there was rockabillies getting on the mic and freestyling. It was fucking sick. It was fucking <laughs> sick, man. Like all different different types of dudes. Like and then all the because you know like like writers and that like you know sure yeah it's the hip hop thing but there was skater punk dudes and shit that were mm. gra- graphing there was just metal dudes who were gra- like all di- different types and all different genres b boys rock up this night was like like to put it like the start of the night everyone drunk in fucking getting the you know like we all got the dole check fucking smashing like five dollar jugs <laughs> getting smashed dj's basically cut session beat juggling dudes getting on the mic b-boys doing the circle and then at the end of it, everyone's just fucking destroying the like Perth. This fucking killer. It's and this, like, this is what's it called? This was Monday Night High Park. This was the foundation, basically, of the Perth hip hop scene that I know, that I kind of grew up with. There was, there was guys actually freestyling and rapping before us, um, that we give ode to as well. Like, um, yeah, Skank One and High Five and that. And these these guys kind of. Those were the guys that we looked up to pretty much that were doing the Australian thing as well. Mm. Never released anything, but probably did some tapes and stuff. But yeah, they were they were the guys that were like, "Oh, okay, yeah, we we respect you. That's the thing we do." And it's, yeah, that's yeah, it's, uh, it's so dope, man. It goes back a long way. So how how long are we talking? I reckon we'll skank in that were the nineties, pretty much. The, even the early nineties, because they're like they're they're into their, you know. 40, 45 age group. Mm. We're, we're starting to kick onto the 40s. But yeah, they were like this, that, that couple of years even older than us. And then so that club night though was happening around what year? That was, that was basically, so 90, late 90s, mm. it started. And it went basically for a solid two years every Monday night. It was a weekly thing. That's crazy. Which I think it started in 98. I'm pretty sure it started in because I remember when I met there and it was like, yeah, come one night. I was like, yeah, sick. And then, yeah, it was sick. So obviously you were going there and then... Because Epinonymous, um, that, cause, because Hunter, me and Hunter were on it and that, um, there's like that track that's on there and then there's a, there's a syllabolic track on there and that's how SBX started. Because like, um, we all went to Monday night and a few other guys came down and then it was like... Riff, Crew get out and freestyle. Oh, what's sick, man? Oh, do you know? Oh, graphic. Oh, yes, yeah, sick. Tomahawk. Oh, mortar. Like, and those guys, Matt, Matty B, like. Um, Always microphone courageous. Yeah, man. Shit. So that, like, and it was weird because, like, at the time, like, it's funny, like, Scotty and Shabazz are telling us stories about, like, you know, when they were in high school, like, all the surfies were giving them shit. Matty B was a surfer. And when he dropped his shit, like all the surfer crew were just like fucking sick Australian hip hop. So oh wow! He cracked. He fucking cracked that because he was a surfer. He cracked like spread the Australian hip hop thing to all the surfy crew. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, that's ill. Yeah, man. So then, like, it it kind of spread our thing, and then we kind of jumping ahead, like we started doing like um all these kind of local like festivals in WA. Like and it's like all these surf surf um surfing comps and shit. So we're doing hip hop shows at surfing comps. So these same guys that were dissing it just started getting into it. Culture of Kings was like like we thought it just existed in Perth. Mm. And then we're like, oh yeah, there's probably got oh no, we got back once again. And Deaf Wish Cast, I remember coming over and seeing them at this place in City Farm. We know, oh God, these guys doing fucking check these guys out. They're fucking sick. So Deaf Wish Cast and Hilltop Hoods basically getting their record, and then Deaf, Deaf Wish Cast coming over first. But then yeah, then we brought the the Hoods over at this this pub for the first time from the back once again release. Ah, oh, so you guys booked the Hoods, bro, so, off the um, back of back once again. It was, they dropped back once again and then we, yeah, brought them over for that. And I think they, yeah, it was that one, back once again. Oh, wow. Back so that was or, Matter of Time. Matter, nah, Matter of Time was the second one. Back once again is the first one, only on record. So what year would that be? That was... 97? 
Nah, 99, I think it was, because then we dropped Epinonymous. I can't really remember. It's all a bit of a wish-wash, but I remember that. Then there was the Culture of Kings thing, because then the Culture of Kings happened, and we're like, fuck. It was every hip-hop artist in Australia at this fucking one show in Adelaide. Here. It was here. Yeah, man. I actually missed the show. Oh, my God, bro. It was the fucking dopest shit, because we did the show, and then, like, Every crew was like, what are we fucking doing? We're rolling around, fucking cunts are just bombing and shit. It was fucking sick. And then police came and started doing that fucking move on shit. Mm. As, <laughs> as they do. As they do. But we were just this massive crew, like, and everyone was just like, fuck it. It was a bomb. Fucking, no one's going to stop us. We were fucking like, well, I think it was like 50 deep or something. That's crazy. <laughs> who, was, who was on that bill? Because that compilation, I mean, that's a certified classic now. Yeah. You know, that's oh, bro. that's like the Australian hip-hop that's compilation. Some, that's like the history of Australian hip-hop, like the start. So Downside had a joint on that or you yeah. had production credits or? No, nah, it was, yeah, I had, well, Downside, but I was still producing because I think we put Battle Me on that one mm. um, from memory. And then there was, well, who else was there? Well, I remember Mass Maddie, MC had the Mass, barbecue yeah, joint. Yeah, Mass MC did barbecue. Woods had um the Sentinel. Yes. Um. Then there was that thirteen MCs, the Posse Cut. Yeah. Was it thirteen MCs and two three DJs? Yeah, that's right. That was the big Posse joint. Was that that was certified, wasn't it? Certified. Was that? Was it certified? Yeah, I think. It, I ah man, don't quote me on it. Oh, yeah. But you know the Posse joint. Yeah, I yeah, had, yeah, I know, had I that on there. Do you know that footage is online now? Is it? Yeah, man. I can see this. Yeah, dude. Like it's it's like the whole shit. Yeah. Oh, after hours, they would. Did they have after a joint? hours? Yep, yep. Big shout outs to fucking headlock, <laughs> man. That dude as a freestyler, fuck. Yeah, they're cool, dude. So he man. they they came over too when we brought the hoods over. How to do PJ Kirk? Like all these dudes came over, and headlock came over, and that's when we first met headlock, and he's just this fucking freestyle demon from hell. That was like, yeah, Hunter had this radio station so this is the thing with the perth hip-hop thing and especially the australian hip-hop thing what was awesome about hunter was that he was the main driver and pusher for it has to be australian hip-hop has to be australian hip-hop. we've got to push australian hip-hop so we had this like little community radio 93.7 which is now um nova in perth but yeah 93.7 was this little <laughs> this joint armadale which is like south of perth it's hell ghetto we used to drive there, and the show was at 1 a.m., start at 1 a.m. till 3. And we used basically took uh, turntables in there, set it up, spit, spun tunes, freestyled, talk shit, like got blazed, fucking smaggoted, and just went on air. <laughs> 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 but because we filled this slot, like the, the, the radio were like, yeah, you can't like swear and stuff, but we just kept going in there. And we had an awesome listening ship and stuff, and that's how we kind of promoted the Hilltop Hood show as well. Oh, wow. And so was that Hunter's, like, that was his show? That was his show with Army, but it was mainly Hunter going down all the time. That being late 90s, I mean, tell us a little bit, I guess, tell us a little bit about Hunter because he's no longer with us yeah. anymore. I never had um, the opportunity to yeah. meet him. Yeah. But obviously there's the Hunter Carp and yeah. Yeah. from everything I hear and see, he's obviously like an iconic, you know. He, he was... Anyone that did their thing that were, they had the talent, but they were sheepish about it. He would be like the guy that would kick you over the line. He would be the guy who would push his shit. If, if it was Australian hip hop and you freestyled, he would be like, fucking sick, fucking do it, do it. Or just rap in general, just do it, do it. You're sick. Killer. Taking that person from like, oh, I kind of do it to like fucking, yeah, I'm going to do it. Yeah, I'm going to record, get in the booth, record, put it down, put it out. Yeah, I heard he was a, a real strong advocate of Australian hip hop. I can't remember who it was that I was speaking to, but they were saying like you could catch Hunter at a gig and he'd buy all the demos and everything, like everything he could get his hands on. Everything if it was Australian. Australian. And yeah, he would get it. So like, well, that's the thing. Like he's like, he, get, he gave me his, like, his records and stuff and, and, and his crate, and then he had a separate crate for, for his son. He goes, I um, want you to hold on to this because um, I want Marley to hear, hear, like, what, in my opinion, what Australian hip-hop is. So he's got this crate of records, 
and it's like wow. all this shit that's in pristine condition. I've just got it there fucking. <laughs> to... Wow, that'd be crazy to go yeah. through, man. But he was like, he had so much passion and like character. Like the song I'm a, is just fucking genius. It's, oh, I'm, it's so genius, man. At the time, it seems so like everyone was like, oh, Bogan, but all of us that knew him, and then when people listened to it, they go, yeah, that's sick. <laughs> By the way, funny, funny story about that joint is that back in, I mean, when would that have dropped? Mid 2000s? No, nah, that was early 2000. So that what? was 2001 or 2002, I think we did Done Deal. Well, there's a, there's a story that. There was um, a couple of dudes who used to do a show on this station. Yeah. In like, I, I think it was like 06, yeah. around the mid 2000s. And they dropped that joint on air. <laughs> and then that was the end of their show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, word. Crazy. So word. every time someone brings up that song, <laughs> it just triggers that memory. And to this day, I don't know if that's exactly the truth. <laughs> but they weren't no longer on air, so I definitely know they got, you know, something obviously happened. <laughs> but yeah, story goes that it was because of that song. Um, Hilarious. But I guess, so tell us, how did you guys like, link up? Yeah. Monday night, Hyde Park Hotel. Oh, so he was one of the guys that yeah, was regularly going there. Regularly going there as well. We all, everyone just met and we was like, because we were all like, oh, you do hip hop? I oh, sick. Yeah. And then we'll just start freestyling. Oh, sick. I oh, sick. Then we just go out, you know, and sort of bomb and shit, and then then go everyone's digits, and then I like the thing why I link with Hunter a lot as well is because he was closer than Scotty and Shabazz, his own fucking Craigie, which is like North Side, and, and Hunter and Army were closer. So they were like kind of like near the city more, so I'd go to their both of those their house a lot, and um. Yeah, with Hunter, we used to just go there and hang out in um, MIRC as well and talk to trials and shit because <laughs> we're all fucking nerds. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. But, um, yeah, and then we'd just sit there and just fucking make funny music because Hunter was like, he just had that funny kind of dark humour as well, just like kind of shock, shocking humour, you know, like like to kind of piss the chicks off and stuff. and. <laughs> <laughs> just to say how loud this shit and you guys actually did a like a full length project together and that's yeah. where that Woody Woodpecker joint so that's that's where Woody Woodpecker and that's where I'm a cunt's on that, that, that was done deal yeah wow yeah that's and that's that fun. that was kind of for, and that's when we got like we did a lot of syllabolic features on it and so it was kind of like a syllabolics thing as well like, you know, like drafts first verses are on there, like that you can get, you know, that's the first kind of appearances he's had on record. Um, I think I can't remember if Layla, because Layla did, because there was Culture of Kings. Actually, Culture of Kings was 2002, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I think it was either 01 or 02. Yeah, it was around I think that with time. Layla, because Layla and Drafto, that was their first ever appearance on record was done deal so that's why crew sort of normally cop, cop that record mm. and why it slowly kind of keeps ticking over it's like oh what's the first thing they were ever on it's like yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah right and then um at what point culture kings 2 yeah was that after the album that you did with hunter yeah yeah culture kings 2 had one of my favorite Australian joints, which was the Hunter joint about being on the doll. Oh, the uh, jam roll. Fuck that and joint. That's so and sick. And the, the, who produced that? Optimus. So okay. that's an opto beat, yeah. That's an ill beat. Yeah, and then man. just the concept of the song and so like- So good. We was- he just like, nailed yeah. it, man. Just nailed it. We were sitting there listening to it going, <laughs> this dude has to be on a doll. <laughs> it was fully, man. Or we has were, been on the doll because he man, just painted such- he was still on the doll like- like, I think he didn't start working until he was, like, 30 or something. Like, Damn. He, I don't know. I don't know why he started working. What? Oh, that's right. Because he because of Mali. Because then he had a kid. And it's like, oh, I better start working, you know. <laughs> <laughs> for, that, for that long time, man, like, that, like, we were all just on the dole, just fucking, you know, getting maggot, getting wasted, fucking eating mushrooms, 
fucking bombing, rapping, making beats. Living that life. Yeah, it was fucking killer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Taxpayer, for financing this. <laughs> oh, shit. There were so many, so many lines in that that I was just like, wow, the shit's just too funny. And had that, you know, real strong Australian accent. Yeah. You know, he did not try to shy away from it, if anything. Nah. Yeah. He went full head steam yeah. for it. Yeah. Yeah, no, nah, that was some funny shit. But he, he, yeah, he used to write heaps. He wrote a lot. There's so much stuff that's just on paper. Like, he used to write a lot. A lot. So, I mean, as someone that was close to him, you know, I mean, how was that? Because it sounds like he had a big influence on you, the whole Perth scene. Yeah. And, like, the whole country. Yeah. It was, um, yeah, it was pretty full on. He was... um. It was weird because he was going through like a lot of, before that actually happened, he started getting pretty um, depressed because he kind of broke up with his miss, missus at the time. And that was, you know, um, um, yeah, because he's having a kid with her and stuff. It was, it was kind of a bit full on for him. So mm. there was times that were pretty heavy then. And then when that hit, it was like, oh, fuck. It's like, what? No. Like. Yeah, man. It the, hit everyone pretty. I mean, it hit everyone pretty hard. But then when it started, kind of, you know, like then visiting visiting him and seeing the kind of physical state state and the change, it's really fucking full on. And then the the physical state starts to happen, and then it's the mental breakdown. And then like, but the thing that kept him fighting through it was fucking rap. Like I would like. It amazed me how fucking driven he was to still rap in the fucking state of pain he was. His voice is fucked. He's fucking just medicated to the fucking eyeballs, but he would still fucking write raps. I'd have to bring my MPC and fucking recording gear into the, the um to the fucking hostel and shit. Like oh, bro, I see he go, man, bring your shit in. Yep, no worries, bro. <laughs> wow, like laying in a fucking in a deathbed pretty much, and then fucking we had to like anchor the thing up, I'd set the mic up in front of him and he'd just fucking still rap, man. Like they would tell him you can't go and do a show because he, like, I think the last show was at Rocket Room, I think, in Perth. And man, it was so emotional, dude. Like crew were fucking like just crying and shit like in the audience. Like it was full on, man. Because by that stage, everybody knew. Yeah, everyone knew. But I think they were sad that they knew that it's coming close, but they were just so emotionally like, in awe of his, like, this is how much he loves it and he doesn't give a fuck. Like, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die rapping. <laughs> That's crazy, yeah. hey. And he actually, like, put out a DVD or some sort of documentary on, like... Yeah, it was a, It was actually... The documentary was these dudes that wanted to do the documentary on him. So it wasn't so much him wanting to do the documentary. It was these guys that wanted to do it. He had an idea to kind of do a self-biography thing as well anyway. But... Then that, it, because of his sickness, it was too hard for him to do, mm. and um, and kind of focus on it. And then these guys did the documentary. So at the time, there's this documentary that was made, which is called I think it's called the Hunter documentary. I can't even watch it. <laughs> yeah, that's Pretty understandable. Yeah. I haven't I haven't seen it. I just remember a trailer came up about it. Yeah, and yeah, the yeah. impression I I got was like, wow, he was like documenting. He was still putting in work. You know, like all the way through, I was like, yeah. "Shit, yeah. that's that's some it's pretty heavy." Yeah, that's some wild. Because they shit. were they were there, they were they were around him a lot as well, mm. and so you know, like as a like your personal space thing, having the camera there all the time, and them, and also them trying to not direct it, but you know, oh yeah, can you kind of say that again? And it's just like you know. It's Why? not that kind of, yeah. Yeah, fucking just feel like, and he's, I'm just funny because it's like, he just wants things to happen. Like, Come on, fucking, you know, let's just fucking do it. Just fucking do it. Nah, fucking, you know, just fucking rap, man. Just fucking record me. Fucking, why are you fucking around? Why are you messing around? And he'd just get, it was, it was the funny thing because he'd always get pissed off because I'd sit there and go, nah, fucking, I'm just going to fucking fix this. And, oh, no, nah, you need to record it again. And he's like, nah, fucking, I've already fucking recorded. Fuck. You're fucking wasting my time. <laughs> he just gets so frustrated. So I could, like when they were doing that, like <laughs> it was it was funny because you know 
that I obviously are trying to fucking get the, the shot or whatever, but he's just like, fucking, I'm fucking, you fucking missed it. It's gone. <laughs> now I heard, you know, obviously that he has a real strong character and funny dude. Yeah. And you can hear it in his music. Yeah. You know, like, like I said, on that jam roll, just line yeah. after line, that shit. That's just... Hunter. That is Hunter down to the T. We used to go to his flat and he would sit and watch fucking TV and because he couldn't fucking bother getting, finding the remote, he wouldn't change the channel. Like, it's just like, why the fuck are we watching this? Because like, I can't be fucking changed to just fucking hell. <laughs> so if I, if, if, if I asked you what's, you know, what's one of the funniest Hunter memories that you, you know, that you can pull off the top. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, there's so many, um, but one funny one, we were staying with, um, <laughs> we were staying at um, Kirk's joint, who was, um, he used to do this thing with PJ called Pulling Strings. Which oh, were, Kirk Ray. Yeah, Kirk Ray. Yeah, shout outs to Kirk. Shout man. outs to Kirk. Kirk. Yeah, Kirk. He will remember this as well. It's fucking hilarious. So I think we go out and T, T was over and we're all drinking and stuff. But then Hunter just fucking smashes it. He just fucking goes hard. And then we're like, all right, we got to fucking go to bed. Like, Charles left and fucking Kirk's like, all right, boys, good night. <laughs> He's still like trying to drizzle. Man, we got to go to sleep. We got to wake up tomorrow. All right, all right, all right. All right. I can go to sleep and like we're in Kirk's back back kind of shit uh, like room or whatever and it's got like a sliding door and then there's a gate because he's got a pool so I'm sleeping I'm fucking like I wake up I'm like fuck it's freezing what the fuck and then I've seen the sliding door open and I'm like I, I wake up hearing like and I just thought it was like the wind like banging something I'm like, what the fuck it's fucking cold what's fucking going on I see the sliding door open I'm like Oh, fuck. We'll run out and fucking Hunter's like, he's so maggot, he doesn't know where he is. And he's shaking the gate, going, fucking let me out. Let me out. <laughs> Kirk comes fucking out and sees us. And he's going, what the fuck's going on? And I go, oh, man, I'm sorry, dude. I don't know. I'm trying to fucking like get Hunter out of it. And I just, I'm like trying to pull him off. And he's like not fucking budging. And so I start fucking punching him. He's still not letting go. I'm just punching him. And then finally he kind of looked at me. He's like, oh, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, okay. And then he just kind of zombied in. And I was like, fuck, if that dude, because the, the gate he walked into and then tried to go out of, there's the pool there. He was so maggoted, like, fuck it. He could have just fallen in into trout. He was so blind. Shit. And then the other thing of that was, um, I'll never forget that night too. Charles, <laughs> Charles just took a photo of him pissing and like he could just see the head of his cock. <laughs> and it's just this funniest photo. <laughs> we just from Charles T. He's like, look at this photo. I got his head. And, <laughs> and he's just like real maggot shirt off like, You There's many that... more, like, he stole fucking Rex's Hunt's fucking carton from, like, it was like, we found this fuck. we are walking, like, I think it was after a gig, we are walking past, with Brand, DJ Brand, mm. yeah, um, and um, we were walking back, and then there was this, we walked through this hotel, cutting through, and there was this fucking carton in front of the door, and it was like, to Rex Hunt, thanks for fucking blah, 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 and they just fucking racked it. <laughs> 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 I think that was the same run, man. Oh, fuck. So he liked his beers. He fucking loved his beer, man. <laughs> what else? I mean, there's so many, I don't know, there's so many Hunter stories. And, like, the thing with Hunter, because he's like, gets on the piss and fucking yarning to everyone. He'll lose his voice before he gets on stage. So, like, the first night, he's like, fucking, you can't have too many beers. I was trying to chill him on the beers before the show. Fucking got maggoted and then, like, the, no, he got maggoted the first night, and then the next thing is the show, and he kind of lost his voice. And then we started doing the show, and like he was like just powering through it, but you could hear he was tearing his voice. And he's like, "Man, I don't want to. I, I just cut the set short." And then I and then I kind of crowd hype, like basically dissing him, saying, "Hunter wants to cut the set set short." <laughs> when I say Hunter, you say <laughs> when I say Hunter is a you say.
There's a he's a fuck you and he's got so revved up because I used to give him heaps of shit and piss him off because I knew he'd get frustrated. <laughs> Backtracking a little bit to I can't remember who you said it was, but you connected with someone who took downsides to kind of like the next level. Oh yeah, yeah. What was Sloney or Paul Sloan? Okay, and then you said once he got involved, yeah, that's when you started getting on festival circuits. Yeah, and so which like Sloney, that. like the fucking tr- the the ace car was Sloney was that he was a promoter. Well, he kind of fell into the promoting thing because he got a, he kind of got pissed off at promoters. He started promoting. He was really good at promoting and putting on big festivals. And the thing that worked for us, so he we got the whole drum thing in that, and then he started booking shows, and he would get us on these big festivals because it was kind of like a barter with the other promoters over east. So it was fucking sick. We kind of got that like good edge and really gave us that good opportunity to get out there and actually, you know, at the time, like playing like Splendor and Blues and the Roots, like, mm. like what's this live hip hop stuff? The other thing though, that was good. Is that and then that was the time when we got this we signed to Hydro Funk, which was the resin dogs. The resin dogs were popping like live. They fucking had because it was kind of live beats and stuff, and crew would see it. They were just, you know, they were like, Yeah, man, we dig your shit and you've got, you know, you've got the drum and drummer and the bass player live. Yeah, we we'll we'll sign you and we'll do your new record, which is Land the Giants. And yeah, and then I think with him on the, like, basically on the pulse of sort of getting us everything and planning our tour and stuff like that. Like, that was basically when things started rolling for real. And we did, and we started actually, we did the, the like, our first national tour and kind of played. The good thing about us is that we've always been about playing heaps of shows and that was kind of the promo, like live, come and mm. see us live. It's live hip hop, you know? That's the grassroots shit. That's the grassroots shit. Like we were even like before the first tour, like Sloney basically booked us every fucking thing. Like we we're supporting metal bands, punk bands, youth festivals. Like, like it, it got to a point where we we're playing like sometimes two times, three times a week. That's crazy. Yeah, like we we're playing heaps. It's out of control. I think and a lot all, of a lot of acts would play three times a year. Yeah. And then, like, all of a sudden, and because he was a promoter and knew how to negotiate, all of a sudden we had all this cake in the bank to actually just fund our, our whole tour. Like, we funded everything ourselves. Like, it was crazy. Wow, and that independent hustle shit. Yeah. So he was really good with that. And, yeah, just logistically as well, knew how to kind of, yeah, basically, like, make it work for us so we weren't basically losing money. We could break even, but then the next tour we made money and then after mm. that we're just making money. Sick. And then was this happening at the same time as you guys were getting pushed from Triple J? Yes. So land when Land the Giants landed and we signed to Hydro Funk and Hydro Funk did an awesome job as well with with their help as well. That's how the Triple J thing happened. And then it all worked in, in like as a snowball effect altogether. Like that machine we had was fucking sick. He and and the thing with Sloney was, yeah, he promoted. He was a promoter. He picked bands, so he kind of knew. Like I know kind of what I'm doing because I'm promoting. I know what bands to pull, what people are listening to. I know how they're doing it, and then my ace card is that I'm a promoter. These promoters can't talk shit to me. Mm. <laughs> it was fucking killer. He was the perfect like thing for it. Can you recall uh, what was the single, your first single on the Jays? It was El Questra, I'm pretty sure. And then what, like Gifted when Life. that? Gifted Life, I think. Can't remember. Yeah. Well, when at first, you know, basically when you first hit the Jays, like how much did that just catapult you guys into? It did, because you know, the, the difference back then is social media just didn't exist. So back then it was like, and then remember all the street mags and stuff, like mm. well, all that street press thing we were getting heaps of as well. So it was such a different game in terms of like marketing. Like, so, and he was just on, on it 
just knew exactly what to do. And the big thing as well was, it, I mean, Triple J did help, but the support of local community radio, like everywhere, made a massive difference as well, which a lot of people forget because, yeah, sure, I mean, Tr Triple J does have a big listening ship, but when you're hitting, like, if, because we were doing regional touring as well, Scotty and Opto used to do a massive amount of, like, radio interviews with all the local community radio stations. So that helped heaps because it's that grassroots thing. Mm. And people came to watch the show, and then it was like, then on our kind of second and third run um, national runs, we started just doing more capital, bigger shows. So it was like just this snowball effect. And people seen us before, and we kind of recognized crew from, like, certain towns and shit. And then at which point, because I remember, like, I clearly remember, like, shit, I think I was, like, 1920 driving around in some piece of shit Ford or something, <laughs> <laughs> burning the clutch out. And, like, the stereo didn't work, so I had to use the radio. Yeah. And that's how I would hear a lot of your stuff on yeah. air back then. And, I mean, obviously then I fell off, you know, listening to radio and stuff. But then I guess I just wouldn't hear of downside much more after a certain period. You know, it might have been like two, three, four years. Yeah. And then I just wouldn't hear the name anymore. Is that, did you guys like put music on the back burner yeah, for a while? Yeah, well, what, what, what happened is I think after the last record, which was All City, we, um, we basically like, we were still writing, but then... Shabazz and Scotty basically had kids. That was basically what happened. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'll it do it, it. It made it hard because um, and and then like as you get like when everyone gets older and you know they kind of start doing the family thing, it's like oh you know I can't just and you know now the doll's not as easy to be on. <laughs> Hunter wouldn't be too impressed nah, about that. Yeah. So like, there's a lot of key factors here that changed in terms of how the band worked and we kind of didn't adjust to it because we didn't know how to mm. like all of a sudden, Oh fuck. You know, well, especially, especially for the other boys. I'm like, oh, fuck, I've got a fucking kid. Fuck, I can't just kind of think of myself anymore. I've got to like, look after them, like the missus and the kid and kind of give them a bit of security. Like, yeah. It's, it's getting a bit hard now. <laughs> can't like the doll's not there anymore. Like you can't, you just can't do that. <laughs> mm. You get old and you're like, ah, oh, yeah time to it's not enough yeah it's time to grow up <laughs> <laughs> in terms of production um who are some of the dudes that you've produced for um well got the lucky chance to do work with guru because he well they featured on our downside track um yeah i remember that shit i forgot about that that yeah. fucked me up when i heard that because he's one of my top five i think yeah yeah how did that come about guru was and at the time it was it was such an interesting kind of way like how it rolled out because um they he came and he was doing that new album and like he kind of like parted with premiere um and did um we hooked up with that Solar dude. And um, so it was, what was that record called? It's called 7.0 or something, something I can't remember. And it was so weird because it wasn't, I don't know, the cover of it was like this Lambo on there. And it's like, not really the guru I know. But anyway, he came over and then I think Army had something to do with promotion, promoting, promoting the show that was in Perth or bought, bought the show in Perth. And then um, that's how we kind of got the link um, to do a, do a feature. And so, yeah, it was, it was sick because, like, I sent a bunch of beats to him. I think, oh, fuck, I sent a beat to this guru. I don't know how I'm going to fucking compare to fucking Primo, but, yeah, fuck, hopefully he picks something. <laughs> and I think, I think he might like this one. And that, that was the one. And, like, he just goes message back straight away pretty much. He goes, fucking this one. This is dope. And we're like, oh, sick. And then, like, he writ... He started writing, um, I think Scotty was like in contact with him and Scotty was like, man, um, Guru's fucking hell vibe on the fucking beat, man. He's like, 
he's loving it and he's like he's already fucking written shit and he like spat some shit to me and like asked me like what do you reckon <laughs> he Scotty was like I was like oh yeah man it's, uh, sick yeah dope <laughs> we love everything you do <laughs> but it was really cool so when we got to the studio like it was awesome. Um, like, it was really awesome the vibe that Guru had because he's kind of chill, but he would really just turn to us and go, what do you guys reckon of this? Like, sick. Just, what do you reckon of this bit? I'm, I'm a bit stuck on there. And then we started kind of working together and kind of workshopping and that. And then with the hook, like, we had an idea for the hook. Well, they, they I think Guru came up with something like what you came here for and, that he couldn't, and then we're like, well, what, what can we put in the gaps or whatever? And Solar was just going, what about this? What you came here for? Put your guns in the air. And we're like, uh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a weird thing going on between them two. I don't know. Oh, I don't know what happened with that. Like, because when he was, when Guru was here and Solar were there, like, yeah, there was a weird, weird relationship in terms of, I don't know. It's kind of strange. Yeah, I've heard all sorts of shit. That, that was just... I mean, just from our, like, I don't know from any other experience, but just from our experience, like, Solo was really, he's a pretty insecure dude, like, in terms of, like, he was just fucking talking about himself the whole time, trying to big himself up the whole time. Like, yeah. And like was, he had to prove something. Like he had to prove something, and we were just like, oh. And then he was kind of making out, like, man, you guys are fucking lucky. You got to, you know, you're working with Guru, man. Fucking, we don't do this shit. Like, and, like, I could see Guru just kind of just trying to just kind of ignore it. And, man, I'm like, what's going on here? So that's crazy that you were actually in the studios yeah. together because you know how collabs work these days with the internet Send a lot off. of the time. Yeah, yeah. But you actually got to have those studio sessions with him. Yeah. Well, it was just the one session. He came in and, like, finished writing and bang, like, and then just wrapped it and like finish it there and then and like i was kind of helping with vocal layers try this try that and like with his backups and stuff like that and then hook and then we're like oh we'll do these parts for you and we jumped in on the hook and that and kind of finished all the vocal bits there was he expensive well, well i think well, fuck, what did he cost it was like four grand i think it was 16 like, bars yeah so if you do the math how much is that per bar? <laughs> don't know. Don't know. Wow. But, but we were like, we were, we were like, yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, you're your tour and you're making the money. We, we, we had we had cash, so we're like, yeah, sweet. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's dope. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, at the time it was like, Guru wants a thing and he's priced four grand. We're like, yeah, sweet. Let's do it. Send us the invoice. <laughs> hey, it's Guru, man. RIP yeah. and he's no longer... You know, yeah, he's no longer here. Yeah, it's fucked. It's fucked. In terms of Australian dudes that you've produced for, yeah, um, I know that you produced on the Hoods Calling album, yeah, which is the one that you know really catapulted them into the next phase of their career. Fuck, that was huge when that dropped. Yeah, man. And I knew you had the production credits on the certificate, the posse yeah, joint. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now is that the is that the only song that you have produced for the hoods? Yeah, and then because with Hunter, because one of his other things he wanted to do was that um, he did the the album, the Canteen album, which is basically all the Australian hip hop heads. And I sent a beat, man. And then that was another beat to do with the hoods, but that was that for that album. But that's why I was kind of here, maybe like you know, I've always been homies with with the hoods. So was, and then every time I come here, I never stay for long enough. Mm. It's just like, ah, oh, we should hook up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do, do some, like, you know, let's do some shit. And then it's, I'm gone. So hopefully, like, hopefully we'll link up this time and do some, do some new jams. Got more skills. Play more instruments. <laughs> got the heat. Yeah, got nah, the heat. Now you're ready. Got the Got hate. more ways of burning shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, another big name that you've produced for is Draft. Yes. And he's actually from Perth as well. Yeah. So tell us how you met Draft and how you got producing. High Park on Monday nights. And then, the, I mean, the thing is like, he, I mean, yeah, it's funny because there was a group of dudes who used to sneak in because they weren't fucking 18 yet. 
Yeah, they'd sneak into Heidi's on the Monday night. Because Hyde Hi- Park's actually, it wasn't a club, it was, it was a pub. It was basically this front bar. And that's why it was like cheap, cheap drinks and stuff. And everyone used to go there. So, yeah, he kind of was sneaking in and started hanging out with me and Hans and stuff. And he was really shy, like. And then one day he was like, oh, hey, oh, I've, I've written this rap. Um, and we're like, oh, sick. And then, you know, Hunter's like, man, yeah, show us, bro. And, like, he was, like, kind of spat at And we're like, whoa, fuck, sick, man. That's fucking killer. And then, and then like, you know, Hunter was like, man, that's fucking so dope, man. Fucking, man, you want to rap on, nah, you're going to rap on Dundee. You're going to rap on, you got to fucking record that on Dundee. And he was like, oh. You know, like fucking sick, and that. If it wasn't for Hunter, there wouldn't be a draft. There would not be a draft. That's how. That's how influential Hunter is. He's, like, even for me as well. Like, I wouldn't be rapping as much if it wasn't for Hunter, because he's got fucking that awesome motivation that makes you go, yeah, fuck, I'm fucking dope. Fuck, this cunt's fucking must be fucking dope, man. Yeah, fuck this. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's wild. It's fucking killer, man, you know? And so you had production credits on Pale Rider and Who Am I? I? Yeah. Then I think at the time, like, he hit me up to do the next record, which was... Brothers Grimm? Brothers Grimm. But it wasn't going to be Brothers Grimm at the time. Um, But I was working on this other record with Tomahawk. I was like, oh, man, I want to do it, but... I've got to, I'm just started this one. I've got to fucking, I've got to fucking get it out of the way. But then he, like, he didn't, hooked up with T and then did Brothers Grimm. And it was like, I was like, fuck. Because <laughs> that's the one that really got him popping. Yeah. Because that it's had, Jimmy um, McCarm. it dropped Jimmy McCarm. And he, I remember him showing me that tune. It's, this is how I fucking don't know what the fucking, I'm fucking on about. He shows me this phrase, man, I think I've written a fucking killer tune. And he showed me Jimmy McCarm. And I was like, oh, fuck, we should have fucking used that fucking tune. Yeah, because me and Scotty actually made a beat with the same sample. And we're like, never happened. And then so he shows me Jimmy McCann. I was like, ah, oh, sick. And he's like, oh, this is the tune. I was like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Sick. Dope track. He's like, do you reckon, do you know, do you reckon, I reckon this would be one. I was like, oh, I don't know, man. See how he goes. Bang. Just fucking. Yeah, that went through the roof, yeah. man. But I just, I never had a clue on like all that shit. I was just like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, try it. it's sick. <laughs> Well, I like, I don't know, I'm the type of dude, I just kind of don't like, I don't tend to gravitate towards the single stuff. Like, I'll probably, I mean, I don't know. Fuck, the last fucking American dude I really fucking listened to was Immortal Technique, you know. I kinda, He's dope. I really get into the kind of that shit. And mm. Just, I don't know. Yeah. The, the other big single from memory on there was Fallen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, is that, there was some That's issue with, there's like, a sample issue, like, with the original. And so that's why Paulie uh, draft asked me to, man, I need to do a remix. Because I think what he did was put, I think what happens, he had to re-put the album out. Yeah, I heard it, they had to take it off the shelf. Yeah. And, and then... So that one had the remix on there. Because I did it, I think that's what I did. Or, I don't know, I can't remember actually. I don't know if he actually put it out with that remix on there. So basically, mm. so basically, Brothers Grimm dropped, it popped. Yeah, those were the two big singles. Yeah, but then Fallen was the one with the sample, yeah, sample issue. Sample issue. So then the record had to get taken off the shelf, and then you remixed that joint. Yeah, and then I remixed that. It was sick because, like, I was like, "Oh yeah, sweet." And then um. I just remixed it because I went to Mumbai and did, we did a downside thing in fucking Mumbai in India. Sick. And, um, yeah, I went basically record shopping there and just got all this Bollywood shit, this old school Bollywood shit, and that was the set, like the sample. So, you know, they're probably not going to come after us for that. In terms of recently, yeah, uh, you produced Curse's Dead Set 6. Yes, I actually produced some of, yeah, well, some of it, yeah. So tell, tell us how that came about. Because oh. when I I didn't know that, and when yeah, I heard yeah, the, yeah. when I heard when I heard Dead Set Six, your name didn't pop up to mind because of the sound and style. Yeah, well, he was like, "Hey man, like I do, you know, the Dead Set thing." Because with, with the story with Cursor, like I'm, I um, met him through um, met him through some local boys in Perth. Heard, heard of him, I was like, "Ah, oh, sick," you know, like fucking, I like the kind of 
grimy like fucking underground kind of rap shit. Um, and um, a lot, um, couple of perp boys like Omac and um, what's his name? Oh, fucking hell. Complete? Uh, no, not complete. Um, I'm trying to think of my homeboy DJs for it. everyone. Oh, I'm just, just cut this so I don't look like I fucking forget about him. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, fuck. Hang on. Let me collect my thoughts. It's yeah, that's L Street. All right. Okay. And then roll it from here. <laughs> so, homeboy L Street, um, who's like another local hip hop DJ, was like, bro. Got a fucking link with cursor man, fucking, you know, he's fucking sick cunt. It's like, yeah, I know. It's like, definitely a sick cunt. That's his thing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, man, fucking. Um, and then basically, I think that's how it kind of the connect, how he was in, in Perth. And then I think he needed a DJ for his set. No, no, he actually hit me up for beats. That's right. Sent him a bunch of beats and not too sure what happened. Like, he was kind of vibrant. And we, I did, it was like that studio thing because I'm, I don't, know, I don't know why I like that. I like, I'm not going to send you beats or, or a catalog. I'm going to make them there while you're there. Um, so I did that. And then, yeah, and then he sort of hit me up to DJ for him. So I DJ for him when he comes to Perth. And then, yeah, and then he just goes, hey, man, like I'm doing the new Dead Set um, thing and I really want a disaster to be on it. And I was like, yeah, cool. And I was like, and, you know, like the vibe's kind of that house thing. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, send me the sample what you want me to work with, and I'll 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 try it. <laughs> and then that's basically what happened. Then he was like, "Oh, do you mind if other crew like kind of help um, help out with production and stuff?" I was like, "Yeah, man, I'm not I'm not um, what's the word? Precious about it." And so there's there's another credit on there that did some some keyboard like house stuff on it. Mm. And so that's how that sort of came about, man. And so where, at which point did you first, I guess, when were you first introduced to Curse's music and what are your thoughts on, I guess, his music and his movement, so to speak? He, man, I've got mad respect for Cursor and I love all his kind of deep introspective shit. It's fucking killer. Hunter would have fucking would have loved him, man. Like, would have fucking loved that shit. Hunter's right into like, where... I don't know. It's like kind of, I don't know. It's I, we kind of tend to gravitate towards more of that style, mm. but you know we do like our other other stuff. But yeah, um, yeah, his. I will say this: <laughs> I reckon Cursor, like, is fuck. He would almost be one, like, almost the biggest hip hop actor other than the Hoods. I don't know. Is that? I think at the moment, right now, today, yeah. you'd have to, you definitely got to put him in the conversation. Yeah, and I man. think that he is the second name that pops up yeah. in mind when you talk about that. I mean, 60 is big, yeah, but 60 on my radar, at least, has been a little bit quiet yeah. as of late. Curses, you know, trying to put out 10 albums in 10 years, he's up to number six and he's on par. Yeah. And like know? the thing is, but the thing is, if you go to Curses show, and you see how fucking fanatic his fans are, man. Like, here, here's the thing for you, right? You Serato? This crowd screams. And, like, it's kind of thing. The beat scheme. What the fuck? Fuck, it's so fucking loud. I go and check the thing. The crowd's making, you know, when you're checking your fucking, um, how noisy it is? The crowd's fucking making that fuck up. Like, that's how fucking loud the crowd is. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I saw his gig at HQ, yeah. I think, last year. Yeah. And when he come out, not only was the crowd wild and my homeboy taps me and I look over, he's just like, yo, look at these chicks. And they was crying. Bro, he's like. Yeah, and I was like, wow, that's some, you know. At that point, I remember thinking, like, once I saw a Curse Alive show, at that point, I remember thinking, whether you like his music or not or what he's about or whatever, go check out his live show. That shit's on some different, like, energy and vibe. The that energy and he's like, the thing is, is he's like got mad love for it and it's like, it's actually really positive. He's got a positive aura, man. Like, it's fucking killer. And like, yeah, he's, it's sick. It's fucking sick. 
Yeah, Sick man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I look forward to seeing him do 10 in 10. Yeah, man. That's crazy. Yeah, As man. anyone that makes music on any sort of level, like, that's a lot of work. Yeah, man. You know, not yeah. to mention with the tours and whatever else yeah. you might have in between. Yeah. Um, An album that recently dropped that you had credits on, production credits, was the new AB original. Yeah. Which I really dig that shit, man, because yeah. it's got like, I like my West Coast yes, shit. So I. <laughs> and yeah, and I was just, you know, you can just feel it. You can hear it. Yeah. Um, we played some of it on the radio. I love that, like, you know, there's joints on there with just some heavy drums, eight bars. So as a DJ, you can mix it. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And just everything about it, man, is is dope. Now, what, what joints did you have production in? Fuck, I'm such a horrible at names. Um, the Feast. Um, hang on, let me fucking double check this because my, my memory's fucked. Um, too Black, Too Strong, is that a track? Yeah, that's yeah. one of the that's one of the singles I think. Yeah, that one. Um, so too black, too strong. Oh, I'm gonna try and do this without looking at it. Hang on. Oh, strong arm, firing squad, strong arm. Hang on, I'll just play. I'm pretty sure it's strong arm. Before you know it, I yeah, this one. Um, you know it, okay, okay, okay. Too black, too strong. Call them out. Strong arm, firing squad, the feast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just forgotten already. <laughs> so yeah, so too black, too strong. Call them out, which is secretly called called a mouse. Shout outs to Briggs and Trials. <laughs> uh, the feast. Um, strong arm. I think that's it. Am I right? Am I right? Should I think help, so. Help me out here, guys. Maybe Man, I I just know that you had credits on there. I yeah. wasn't I wasn't a hundred percent sure exactly which joints. Yeah, but yeah. I mean the whole album. It's fucking so is, fat. Yeah, like, January twenty six is so fat. Yeah, that was. I think that was the first one I heard. Yeah. Which and was, I think that's the one with um, Sultan on it as well on the hook. And it just like instantly, like it just had that, you know, that bounce to it. Oh. And then the hook comes in with the vocals. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. you know, <laughs> you're just like, damn, <laughs> the fuck is this? Yeah. And the funny thing is, man, is that like when I first heard Australian hip hop would have been, man, I think the first Aussie hip hop joint that really caught my attention was the hoods um, off left foot, right foot, solar to beat. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was living in Flagstaff Hill, which yeah. is like 15 minutes from Blackwood, which is yeah. where they was at, I'm yeah. pretty sure, at the time. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, these dudes live, like, down the road. This beat is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. And I wasn't used to the Australian accent, but the beat was just so hot to me yeah, that yeah, I was yeah. like, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I got into it. Yeah. But then as I got more and more into it, I was just waiting for that AB Originals without knowing that that's what I was waiting for. Yeah, and yeah. then when it dropped, yeah. I was like, that's the shit I've been waiting for <laughs> yeah, for like yeah. 15 years. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on, I guess, the whole political stance behind their music and what they're sort of pushing? Oh, I'm fucking with them 100%, son. <laughs> yeah, like Australia is illegally founded under mm. Terra Nullius, which is basically claiming that fucking there was no humans here when they, they came, you know, to try and colonize or whatever. And um yeah, basically it's it's kind of um yeah, I'm just with them the whole way. Definitely like a it's it, I don't know. I, I feel like the whole thing with kind of the respect thing, it is a thing of not listening to kind of what crew have to say and then kind of just dismissing it as, ah, oh, fucking, you know, get over it or whatever. It's pretty full on. Like, yeah, it's, it's not hard. an easy thing to get it's over. Not, if, if, it, if it, it's, a, I think a lot of people don't really put themselves in the shoes, shoes of, you know, 
those people and, 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 you know, listen to them to kind of, you know, you know, imagine like, also imagine like, you know, generations of your family have these stories that aren't told in history books and even aren't, you know, even, um, even indigenous spokespersons are going out and saying all these stories, but then there's all the personal stories that happened from my, well, my grandmother's, well, my great grandmother has this story, you know, she was taken from like, you know, she was taken from her family and just basically doesn't know who her mum and dad is. Don't know where her area is. Don't know their language. Like all of that's gone. It's gone. Yeah, man. When you break it down, it seems pretty fucking unbelievable. It's, it's a hard thing to, it's a hard thing to kind of, and then the negative connotations of what's stolen from you just carries on through the generation. And then what, what if, you know, that ne- negative negative that negative impact has then gone into the booze or whatever or whatever. And then that's passed on to their kids. Like, do you see how hard it'd be to actually just get out of that? It's, it's really hard. I don't think, I don't think necessarily like now the system or anything is like kind of racist or anything like that. It's still more of people kind of really kind of just having that compassion to kind of listen and it's just getting to a point where now it's like taking AB originals to just get gangster about it on some fucking fat beats. On some G-funk shit. On some fucking G-funk shit. <laughs> what do you think about the whole changing the date of Australia Day? Oh, definitely. More so because of, it's more so because of what it means to, to um, you know, to, to Indigenous crew in terms of it. Like the emotional kind of, I don't know, talking myself into a bloody twist of words here. But yeah, like it, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's an it's emotion, emotional thing to do with and just kind of that respect. Okay, yeah, we will change the date because it does mean that we came here, like, well, the, the, the English came here and fucking just took everything from you. And said you weren't human, therefore we can take by our law you're not human because we're not going to say you're human. Because that's how we that's how we conquer land, Terranalius. There has to be humans here for us to claim Terranalius, or we have to wipe all of yous out. Yeah, that's fucked up. Yeah. So for them, it's basically like a genocide. Mm. You know. Yeah, you can understand why that, you know, the I get, I get, community. and I get the whole Australian thing is fucking awesome. Like, we're all here, we're all immigrants, or whatever, like that, you know, and we're all kind of living together, and that's great. But like, we can celebrate on another day, like May the 8th, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no. Now, when, when I, um, when I check like some of, because Briggs is on TV now, to my understanding. I don't. I haven't actually caught Bruce an episode. <laughs> yeah, I ain't caught an episode of the of the show. Yeah. But I, I like. I've been told like, yo, Briggs is on on telly now on, yeah. on a show like co-hosting. Yeah. And um, you know, I see some of the stuff that gets put online, and one of the biggest criticisms I see written down is that they kind of feel that the way Briggs carries himself online with some of the things he says is actually creating more. I guess division mm. between cultures as opposed to cohesion. Yeah. What do you think? Um there's always yeah, it's hard because <laughs> oh man, I just I kind of love trolls as well and, and Briggs is a troll. <laughs> <laughs> but there are other people there are other trolls out there like I think the hardest thing I guess I mean, I can't really speak and I can't tell people how to act in that. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, if that's his way of fucking going out there, I'm going to support the brother. Like, do you know what I mean? Because to me, like, you, if you're an immigrant and you come here, you're blessed that you're here and you have to respect whatever history that's gone down the way it, the way it is, not the way how you want it to be. Mm. And And... If someone's going to tell you in a harsh way how the history is and how it, it, it really is, then, you know, you can either get pissed off about it and fucking fire back or you can kind of go, okay, hang on, maybe I should think about this and then, you know, make your decision. It's kind of hard to like, 
you can't tell people how to yeah like i i mean i, I can go like oh man this i reckon will be the best way to go about it maybe we should you've got to be a bit more di- diplomatic and thing but you know it's, it's Riggs, man he's gonna just do it how he fucking feels like he should tell it yeah and no, fucking, i enjoy it yeah i enjoy it too i enjoy seeing people actually look, well i enjoy i mean that what i love about briggs and when i used to go and watch watch his solo sets is like part of the thing was like he would just fucking crew were just like trying to heckle him and he's just shutting them down like sick just yeah it's entertaining reversing the troll and then just like ah oh, yes you know it's so entertaining it'd be very interesting to see i guess what the next record mm. comes out because i'm sure after the way that this one's been received you know yeah. they'll be doing number two and man, I can't imagine, you know, you always try to top your last. Yeah. But if they top that, shit. That's what I'm here for. I'm trying to hook up with T. Get <laughs> some more beats. I'm getting real I'm getting real on the on the G Funk. On the topic of when we were talking about Hunter. Now, in Adelaide, there's a guy here that goes by the name of Damo. Yeah. I imagine you'd be familiar with Damo. He had that album. Yeah, I remember. Classified I remember. or declassified. Yeah. And he had a line in there. Well, he had a couple lines in there. Yeah. And I think one of them was like something like, you know, stepping to me is, oh, what was it? I remember there was a line that was, I, I actually thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> stepping to me with your washed out drunken flows, you're asking for disaster like crowds at Hunter shows. <laughs> that was that yeah. was the line. Um, Bermuda Triangle was the name of his joint, right? 2007. There was another. There was another one. Like um, it, it was. What was my shit? What was my flows dark? He said my flows darker than. One of the guys from Downside. One of the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do remember that. Heaps of people, I don't know. Darker like, than the brown guy from Downside. Darker than the brown, brown guy from Downside, yeah. Now, when that, because I, I, I remember that um, <laughs> off the, I mean, that whole record that he did, that whole album was just punchlines back to yeah. back. And I think he took shots at pretty much everyone, but yeah. I think it was all just in the, the nature and culture of hip hop. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I mean, uh, it takes a lot for me to really go, fuck that fucking cunt, you know? Like, when I first heard that, and I remember Hunter was like, fuck that, I like, just blew up because he's so emotionally thinking that. But he did have respect for the, the whole, like, because punchline after punchline was, he was fucking smashing it, dude. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, I heard he pissed a few people off, though. Yeah. This is, uh, I think he couldn't go to Sydney for a minute. I don't know how true that is. Yeah, I think yeah. He, he pissed off Hijack and Torture. Yeah, because there was a... Yeah, I mean, he yeah, he took shots at everyone, you know, almost everyone. Now, the interesting thing is, is I imagine you're familiar with um, uh, those mixtapes that DJ Cancel put out, Battle Hogs 1 and yeah, 2. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, the crazy thing is, is that five days ago... Mm. Someone showed me Battle Hogs 3, which hasn't been released, right? Yeah, yeah. And I had like 22 joints on there. And when I heard it, I was like, holy shit, this shit actually exists. Yeah, yeah. It's rough. It hasn't been mixed down or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But there's a song on there by Hunter, and it's called uh, Whack Cunts. Oh, right, yeah. And the person who played me the joint told me that that was actually his response yeah right to, to the da- yeah to yeah, demo yeah right do you know about that oh, i can't remember like i because it was i mean that that the, the battle hook thing was all on because it was a mixtape thing i can't remember if it was like any like so anyone produced like did a beat for it or, or whether it was like jack beats and stuff so I, I can't actually remember i remember kind of hunter pretty riled up like in terms of like he wanted to respond in a track because that's what you do. You know, yeah, that's as long as you know, the see, that's see, the thing with, with the thing with Hunter was, you know, he'd get fucking so pissed off, but he would, he would just want to respond in a hit battle track. And that's where it would stay for him. Yeah, man. The joint yeah. was the, the, like, from what I remember, man, the joint was good. Yeah. I was right, like, right. oh, wow, this is about Damo. <laughs> Dude was like, yeah, it's his, re- it's his response. Oh. Uh. 
and he doesn't he says somewhere in there that he's not mentioning the name yeah yeah something to the extent of because it's not worth mentioning because he doesn't want to give him props yeah. <laughs> so he's just throughout the whole song using the reference whack hunt yeah 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 it's yeah no, i I'd, I'd love for people to hear it yeah but, you know obviously Dudes yeah. ain't gonna leak that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. but it was a like it was a I, you know. I kind of remember. I remember that. I remember when Cancer was like hitting him up and stuff, and then yeah, he was like, well, "Fucking!" I remember him like, "I'm gonna fucking do this fucking response thing, but I'm not gonna name him and shit." Fuck that guy, fuck. He got <laughs> just getting so frustrated, and it, it, that was the funny thing about it. He's like that coming back to Hunter's frustration. He just wanted to do it like quick, 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 because it's all about just going back quick, you know. The, the, the lesson. Oh, yeah.